welcome to Science Cafe. Thank you all for coming. Um, I want to start and just say uh, thank you to our sponsors today. Um, the, the library and the wonderful library staff here have helped us out for this event. Um, Sigma Psi and of course the Office uh, of the Vice President for Research. And I really want to send a special thank you to our program partners who help us to market these events and really get people in. Um, our program partners for this month were the, uh, the student chapter of the American Veterinary Medicine Association, the Pre-Veterinary Medicine Club, and the College of Veterinary Medicine Graduate Student Association. I just want to give them a round of applause for all of their help. Thank you so much. So um, without ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Michael Davis. Um, Dr., uh, Dr. Davis is a veterinary physiologist and board certified specialist in veterinary internal medicine and veterinary sports medicine at Oklahoma State University, where he conducts research on animal exercise physiology and performance. His studies in dogs have included the development and validation of preventative methods for exercise-induced gastric disease, as well as helping to identify no novel metabolic pathways used by elite canine athletes to support fatigue-resistant resistant endurance exercise. These studies have provided the United States Armed Forces with valuable information on the physiological capabilities of working dogs, as well as the methods for producing maximal performance and sustainability of these dogs. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Davis. Well, thank y'all for uh, coming out and um, glad to see a crowd and I understand there are even more crowd uh, behind the lens of the camera. So um, I'll try to keep them in mind as well. Um, wanted to present a little bit of, uh, oh gosh, now over two decades worth of work on um, trying to understand how um, endurance athletes work. Um, I, I'm kind of fond of athletes, no matter what they uh, are or what they do, as long as they do it well. Um, I want to understand how they do it well. I want to keep them performing well. And so that's kind of where my career has taken me. Um, I originally trained as a clinical veterinarian and I worked as a clinical veterinarian for a while and um, just kind of got frustrated with the fact that uh, I didn't know enough about the patients that I was working with um, and nobody was telling me. So I decided to go find out for myself. So that's how you wind up in a career in research is uh, by getting angry at uh, um, your lack of knowledge when you're being asked to treat a patient. So a lot of the work that we've done is uh, been on some, some of the best athletes in the world. And so, you know, who are the best athletes in the world? Are they humans? I mean, you know, humans do pretty well. Um, Tour de France, you know, 2,000 miles in 23 days, of course they are on a bike, and so they do have a little bit of a mechanical advantage. Um, Ironman triathlon, well, not all of that is bike. A fair portion of it is, but, oh man, they, you know, if you ever talk to a triathlete, uh, you know, the swimming's not too bad, the biking's okay, but after you've done all the swimming and you've done all the biking, and, and now you get to do a marathon. The cool thing, and anybody know the history of a marathon? Marathon is a very, 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 very old athletic event. Um, and the people who do marathons are rarely aware of the fact that the very first person that ran a marathon ran the marathon and then collapsed dead at the finish line. How that becomes a sport, I don't know. Um, but Ironman triathletes are pretty, pretty solid human athletes. They have nothing on horses. Horses, you know, 100 miles, the Tevis Cup is uh, uh, kind of the premier endurance event. 100 miles and a 6,000 foot descent in 14 or 15 hours in the California desert. I mean, that's a pretty substantial thing, considering the fact that you're also carrying a rider. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's kind of the, the ultimate in equine endurance. Um, and then you have sled dog racing. And this is the start of the annual Iditarod, 
they've got it toned down a little bit because you know you're in the middle of downtown Anchorage so you don't have a full team you've got very very soft punchy slow snow and you've got three people on the sled to slow the sled down so that that 12 dog team is somehow manageable for 10 to 12 miles for that you know little parade start so you know the actual race is a thousand miles while pulling a sled cross country you're going over the Alaska range you're within sight of Denali the highest peak in North America for a couple of days you know you, you cover that thousand miles in 13 days and you come triumphantly into Nome and you discover that the winning team got there five days ahead of you so currently if you are planning on winning Iditarod you have to have a plan that gets you across that thousand miles in eight days and change because there will be several other teams that will do that and if you want to win you got to finish ahead of all of them I think that kind of defines the world's greatest endurance athlete and some of the numbers are staggering so these dogs are not like the dogs that you've seen on TV they're not the Disney sled dogs these are little 50 pound mutts basically Alaskan sled dog is not a recognized AKC breed it's just you take a fast male and you take a fast female and you put them together and theoretically you get fast babies that grow up to be fast sled dogs um, and you really don't care what they look like or anything as long as they're fast when they're fully conditioned a 25 kilo dog will turn over 12,000 calories a day what do 12,000 calories look like the average you know the recommended daily intake for an average human that's three times the size is about 2,000 calories if a dog was eating Big Macs to fuel that 12,000 calories there would be 24 Big Macs a day every day day in day out until you run out of trail and you get to the finish line that's an enormous you know and, and if you were to scale that up to a human you you know corresponding human size you're looking at well over 70 Big Macs per day they don't get fat they in fact lose a little bit of weight because it's you know bottom line is trying to convince a dog to eat 12,000 calories a day is sometimes a little bit of a trick so that kind of gives you an idea of the metabolic machine that we're dealing with how does it work well we break it down into very very simple elements exercise is not that complicated at least as a first approximation you've got chemical energy you need to get chemical energy to the muscle cell you need to convert the chemical energy to mechanical energy and you need to get rid of the waste products that's pretty much it and then if you want to do it very very well you have to do a lot of that very very quickly um, but the basic pieces whether you're walking running power lifting swimming whatever the basic pieces are all the same get the substrates in there convert them to mechanical energy get rid of the waste and you do that over and over and over again and the more you do that the better the athlete you are so it's kind of like starting off with a little bitty lawnmower engine and you put in some fuel you get a little bit of work out of it and you get rid of the waste same basic deal only in this case we're talking about you know a 500 horsepower Corvette engine a lot of fuel a lot of waste and a lot of work so from the standpoint of a living system the fuel is going to be oxygen and some sort of carbon carbon bond our cells are set up to take the energy in the carbon carbon bond and harvest that energy convert it into a currency that our muscles can use 
and, and we do work. That carbon-carbon bond, you know, that can be glucose, it can be fat, but whatever it is, you've got to get it to the muscle. And the, in a lot of instances, this winds up being one of the limiting steps. It, it all has to go in order, and so whichever step is the slowest, winds up dictating the capacity of the whole system. So if you're having trouble getting substrate to the muscle, doesn't matter how fast you can burn it and how well you can get rid of waste. If substrate provision is the limiting factor, then that's as fast as you're going to run. So what we do, you know, it, it, going, going and doing the work at the races is a lot of fun. But we found out pretty quickly, races are not suitable for, for doing research. There's not enough control. We are scientists. We're trying to do this in a scientific fashion. The race is a race. I mean, we, we, we don't get to control when it happens, where it happens, how the different teams operate. You know, it's great to be there. It's a lot of fun very exciting. I recommend it highly. Iditarod is, you know, there, there's a list that uh, Sports Illustrated puts out of, you know, the bucket list sporting events that everybody ought to go to. Iditarod is on that list. It's the only one that does not have a ticket to observe it. You show up in Anchorage on the first weekend in March and you're there. As well, as well as, you know, 15 to 20,000 other people standing on the sidewalk, but, you know, there you are. Um, what we do instead is do what we refer to as invitationals, where we will simulate the race environment, but we'll do it under our terms. So the video here is a, uh, you know, one of our favorite race courses. It's, it's the Denali Highway, which is a dirt road. If anybody's ever been to Alaska during the summer, it's a dirt road that you can drive down and you can kind of look at out, look all the scenery. They stop maintaining it in October. By December, it's got a couple of feet of snow on it and it's the perfect race course because it's a two lane road. It doesn't have any branches overhanging. It doesn't have any bridges missing. It doesn't have any creeks that you have to go through. It's a two lane highway that's 150 miles long and we can just sit there and go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it provides us with a perfect environment for conducting our research. We call it an invitational because only certain ken kennels get to attend and we pay them. You know, they, 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 they have the advantage of knowing that they're gonna get a purse no matter what they do, as long as they show up. They just have to follow our rules. So, First things first, how, what have we figured out? Well, again, we have to go in order. And the very first thing that we have to get them to do is eat 12,000 calories. If they, don't, if they burn 12,000 calories and they don't eat 12,000 calories, what happens? They're gonna lose weight. And you can, you know, if you, if you, lose, if you burn 12,000 calories and you only eat 8,000 calories, you've burned 4,000 calories of body tissue in one day. A 25 kilo dog will disappear right before your eyes if you do that too many times in a row. So if we want them to be able to do this, we got to figure out how to get 12,000 calories into them. And it's one thing to measure out 12,000 calories. So, you know, the pile of Royal Canaan 4,300 that's half of what they have to eat in a day. And it's a big pile of food. It tastes good, but it doesn't taste that good. And the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, they have to we eat it willingly. You can't sit there and, you know, cram one kibble at a time down their throat because there won't be any time left to run. So we get kind of creative. And one of the, the more creative things is what they refer to as the premium fat blend. That's basically rendered animal fat. And 
it comes in a bucket and we you know scoop it up with little ice cream scoops and we make little scoops of, of essentially pure fat. This is nasty stuff. I mean, this is really, really disgusting. And it's one of the benefits that this sport occurs below zero. <laughs> because if you let that stuff get to room temperature, you will th have to throw away or burn any clothes that you're wearing around it because they just get, you know, you get this odor about you that it's very difficult to get out of your clothes or get off of your skin. So, but you know, at 20 below, they're nice hard little non-liquid balls of fat and the dogs love them. So you can just sit there and throw the dog and they jump, they grab them out of thin air and, and uh, swallow them down and, and they got another couple of thousand calories to go burn and let's go run some more. So it get, gets a little interesting, but we have figured out how to get the food into them. Once we get it into them, that's not it. It's not just that we have to get it into them. We have to get it into the muscle cell. And this is where it gets a little sciency. Um, so there are, in, in general, the nutrients don't just flow into the muscle cells. You got a cell membrane in the way. And you got to figure out how to get these molecules across the cell membrane. In the case of glucose and in the case of long chain fatty acids, we have to provide them with specific transporters. Now, if you, you know, you talk about an exercising muscle cell and the need to have the ability to get this food into the muscle cell for the muscle cell to burn. Well, the range of muscle cell metabolism can be 20 or 30 fold. So when the dog's taking a nap, the muscle's burning almost nothing. When the dog's running, the muscle's burning 20 or 30 times as much fuel. If you just leave the capacity to transport substrates into the muscle cell at that 20 to 30 fold level all the time, none of the other cells will get anything to eat. So you have to regulate it. And you regulate it one of two ways. You either regulate it with insulin or you regulate it with contraction. When the muscle starts contracting, that's kind of a sign that, okay, metabolism is going up, we're gonna need more substrate, so contraction activates the expression of these transporters on the cell membrane and the more they do that the more substrate the more glucose the more fatty acids you can get into the muscle cell to burn same sort of thing happens with insulin but for different reasons muscle winds up becoming a storage site for our nutrients our our, our energy substrates and insulin secreted when we have more than we need, like right after a meal, and insulin causes the expression of these transporters. The transporters allow the glucose and fatty acids to come into the cell, and then it just gets kind of packed away in there and saved for when the muscle starts to exercise. So either way will work. These guys turn out to be very, very nice dogs for evaluating the action of insulin. And so we've used this model to actually advance the study of diabetes. You know, the failure of insulin to make glucose leave the bloodstream and go into the muscle cells. Um, and this is one of the places where we start to encounter um, differences in the dogs compared to all the other mammals that, that have ever been studied. If you give a dog a bolus of liquid glucose, just intravenous bolus, squirt it in there, it's just like they just ate, you know, they, they just foraged in a candy store and, you know, they've got all this glucose suddenly, what's supposed to happen? Well, the, you know, we don't want it in the bloodstream, it doesn't do any good, we secrete a bunch of insulin, it goes into the muscle, goes into the liver, goes into tissues that respond to insulin. and to the degree it can do that, you know, that indicates that these tissues are capable of 
taking up these substrates. That's step one for being able to exercise, is you've got to have that glucose molecule or something related to it. Well, the dogs get very, very good at this. And, you know, one of the things that we've discovered is that not only are they very, very sensitive to insulin, so a little bit of insulin and the muscle cells just fling wide open and they start sucking glucose out of the bloodstream. The dog's muscles don't even wait for the insulin. So about half of that intravenous bolus of glucose is cleared before insulin ever shows up. They've decided that there's only one thing for glucose to do, it's to go into the muscle. We don't need to be told that anymore. We're just going to set the entire system up so that that happens automatically. It's an amazing process. Um, and we don't know how it works yet. It's one of the things that we're working on right now is that this has never been seen before in any kind of animal, humans included. You know, so we're in uncharted territory, but you know, the dogs, you know, the, the key to doing these sorts of studies is I need you to just kind of lay there with a catheter in your arm and let me take a, a drop of blood every five minutes out of the catheter. And the dog says, eh, okay, because they don't mind. They, they, they just kind of like curling up in their little sky kennel and they go to sleep. And in fact, I didn't include it in here, but I actually have a video of us taking a blood sample from the dog without waking it up. You know, it's a, they're, they're so chill. They just kind of, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm going to sleep now. Wake me up when it's time to go run. But if we want to talk about exercise, Insulin is insulin, and insulin's great, and insulin pays the bills And you know, when we're talking about you know, getting funding for studying diabetes, but eh, you know, that's not really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in exercise. So what we'd really like to do is see what happens with when they do contraction. And these were some of the toughest studies that we've done because, yeah, contraction will cause those transporters to upregulate and be expressed and allow the muscle cells to suck nutrients out of the bloodstream. But as soon as you stop contracting the muscle, those transporters go away very, very quickly. So we needed to catch those transporters on the surface of the muscle cell. We needed to get that piece of muscle out as soon after contraction as possible. And so this was one that was utterly nerve wracking, but we ran the dogs on treadmill for 30 minutes with the catheter for the anesthesia already in place. So that at the end of 30 minutes, dog goes you know, into the next room, gets knocked out, and we get a piece of muscle out of their back leg. Dogs still panting from the exercise effort as we're doing this. This was, this was nerve wracking. But we managed to do it. You know, everybody, everybody survived. Everybody, in fact, the dogs that uh, we did this with later won uh, one of the big races that year. So not only did we not hurt them, but you know, <laughs> they they won the race. And I'd like to think I had something to do with that. Um, but what we discovered is something that everybody kind of thought was true, but had never been proven that not only do the dogs develop more transporters as they get more fit, but similar to the whole phenomenon with insulin sensitivity of the, the transporter expression, they develop an increase in contraction sensitivity. So for the same amount of exercise, you get much, much more expression of the transporters and therefore a much larger rate of uptake of substrate when they're exercising. So they've done basically what you th would think you would need to do. If you want to exercise a lot, you're going to need a lot of substrate and you need to have a mechanism in place to pull that stuff out of the bloodstream and get it into the muscle cell to be burnt. Make sense so far? Well, so we've gotten it into the muscle. Now let's see what happens. Do they burn it? You know, again, this was another one of those tricky little studies that uh, 
took us a little while to figure out how we were going to do this, and it's still considered, an, you know, kind of an epic sort of study amongst friends of mine. But you see the dog sitting here, and, and one of the things about burning 12,000 calories per day, and we're going to touch on this here in a little bit, if you burn 12,000 calories, you generate 12,000 calories of heat that you need to get rid of. And so when you're exercising, it really is a good idea to be in a cold environment. Well, whether you're exercising in a race or you're exercising for Dr. Davis during one of his research programs, yeah, it winds up having to be cold. So all the stuff that you see us doing is typically in single digit temperatures, you know, which is not what we're built for. <laughs> you know, I, I, I mean, I vacation in the Caribbean. Um, this is not this is not my deal. So, you know, the the technique that we needed to do um, involved the dogs getting a continuous IV infusion of saline with some some uh, some markers in it, and we have to keep that running for 90 minutes in four degrees Fahrenheit. We had a little bit of a technical challenge. So, you know, you see the dog sitting here in the kennel and, you know, we've got uh, a little sleeve. So the catheter's in the dog's arm and so we've got a little sleeve that the dog's wearing that's covering up and, and kind of insulating that. And then you see a very short length of, of IV line uh, going up to the dog's back and then we've got it all nestled inside the fur so the, the IV line's being warmed by the dog. Um, and then it gets into the, the pipe plumbing or the, the pipe insulation and we run it all the way into the, the, uh, the cooler that I've drilled holes in and on, the, on uh, one end you see the pipe insulation coming out of the cooler. What you don't see on the other end is a blow dryer and we basically just got a blow dryer jammed in the, uh, the other side of the cooler and we've got the blow dryer running and you know, it's, the air is coming down the little pipe insulation and keeping everything warm. And, and uh, you know, when we figured out this was going to work, well, I mean, many of you have blow dryers. Um, do blow dryers like to remain on for 90 minutes straight? Mm -mm. No, so this was one of those crazy little things that, you know, the OSU accounting uh, kind of flagged when I submitted the receipt for 24 blow dryers from Walmart in Fairbanks, Alaska. Um, plug the one in and we'll just figure out, you know, when it burns up, we unbox another one and stick it in there. I've got 23 boxed up hair dryers sitting in a closet up in Alaska because the first hair dryer lasted the entire study. <laughs> there you go. But there you have Biscuit and Biscuit's just kind of running along and Biscuit enjoys it. Um, the room is very cold, and so you can see the musher, Ali Zirkel, she's all bundled up, and brisket, Biscuit's just kind of cruising along, and got the little uh, line running um, back to the cooler. You'll see the cooler here in just a second. And there's Ali, and Ali's, you know, I mean, this is what she does for a living. Um, See the people in the back, um, they're not doing this for a living. These are folks from the lower 48 and they cannot believe that they signed up for this study because they are freezing their tails off in this room. We had to do 24 dogs like this, loads of laughs. And, and, and Biscuit's just like, yeah, okay, we're just doing it. Scenery never changes, but that's okay. So what we've discovered as much as the dogs are, you know, we're feeding them massive amounts of fat because that's what the textbook says endurance athletes burn. A successful endurance athlete burns a lot of fat. The dogs don't. We're feeding them a ton of fat. That out of that 12,000 calories, 8,000 calories of it is fat. And yet the first thing that they reach for when they start exercising is glucose. And if you give them enough glucose, they will preferentially burn glucose over fat for as long as glucose is available. 
We did not expect this. We still don't know where the glucose is coming from because, well, dietarily, we're giving them fat. You know, and, and, and you know, we, we're holding out the possibility that we're going to discover a way of converting fat to glucose in the body. And that will be a Nobel Prize winning effort. I don't think it's happening, but you know, I can't come up with another explanation. And you know, that would be a huge thing for, you know, for all sorts of human maladies. But bottom line is that we feed them fat, they burn glucose, they successfully race, we still haven't quite figured it out. But they have. And then what do you do with all that heat? Heat is the primary waste product. Yeah, I know that in you know, biochemistry they talk about CO2 being you know, an end product of, of um, oxidation of glucose. And the CO2 is, but they don't have any problem getting rid of the CO2. They do have a problem getting rid of the heat. So as a you know, rough conversion, for every five, uh, you, you release five kilos of, or kilocalories of heat for every liter of oxygen burned. When you look at how much oxygen the dogs are burning and you multiply it by a 12 dog team at a nice little kind of easy trotting pace, that team is producing over 100,000 kcals per day, which is roughly the equivalent of 112 kilowatt hours, which is what your electric bill is based on and 112 kilowatt hours is basically what it costs to cool an average Oklahoma home in the middle of the summer. So every single day those dogs are producing that much energy going down the, going down the trail. And bottom line is that they cannot store it. They have to dissipate it. How do you dissipate it? Well, you gotta bring it to the body surface and there you have an interaction between the body and the environment that you can dissipate heat across. You and I have skin that is largely not all that hairy and we have sweat glands and so we have skin with a lot of perfusion that allows us to move a lot of heat up to the surface of the skin to dissipate across the skin. Dog skin is like the lower um, image. They don't have sweat glands. They have very thick fur. This was never meant to dissipate heat. So even if you clip the dogs, you're still not going to get much in the way of heat dissipation because the body's simply not designed to move heat to the surface, except for their foot pads. They do have a very, very thick capillary network in their foot pads far in excess of what the foot pad itself needs to remain healthy. Why is all the extra capillary, why are all the extra capillaries there? It's to get rid of heat. And so, you know, the primary way the, across the skin for a dog to dissipate heat is going to be through its foot pads until the dog gets very, very hot. Eventually the dog will try to get rid of heat across the skin, but you got to get the dog up to like 108 degrees. It's not a good thing for the dog to be. Instead, they use their tongue. So they've got, you know, a very, very large capillary network inside their tongue, and they can increase the blood flow to their tongue, you know, two or three fold during exercise to try to get rid of the heat by evaporating it off the tongue. You notice that as they're rearranging their circulation to prioritize the important places and, and kind of uh, reduce perfusion to the non-important places, skin perfusion actually goes down. So, you know, and, and this is not unique to sled dogs. This is just how dogs work. You can't do a very good job of cooling a dog across its skin because the heat's not there to be cooled. So it more or less looks like this. When you compare visible and infrared, you can see basically the dog's faces. And here comes another team. 
right behind him and a bunch of dog faces, but not a lot of skin uh, or not a lot of skin heat. Just one after another. These are, these are 16 dog Iditarod racing teams. This was about 30 minutes after the start of the race um, at the last road crossing. And they are already up at st you know, steady state and just cruising right along, but they're relying on their faces and their tongues to dissipate the heat. Not a lot of surface area, so you gotta have a lot of cold. And that's why we wind up doing this. You know, that's why the sport occurs in the winter, in the cold, um, because you know, the dogs need it in order to dissipate the heat. Doesn't make for a lot of fun for us. Um, this, was, this was one of the first really large studies that we did. And you know, if it's five, seven, five to seven days long, you know, we, we may have one or two days that have really nice weather. And then we have these and we still have to get out there. You know, we've spent all the money and so we gotta just get out there and start collecting data. It is, um, the cold makes for a very interesting experience. And in fact, for those of you as, as we're coming up on, on the dead of winter in Oklahoma, which is kind of comical to say out loud, but um, the cold actually does pose some serious problems because, you know, you, everybody's, everybody's felt that burning sensation in the back of their throat when they get out there and they exercise on the first really cold morning in Oklahoma. Basically, whether you like it or not, it, the cold air is gonna suck moisture off of your respiratory tract. And if you lose enough moisture, you actually damage it and you actually can do some pretty serious damage to yourself. You know, the, the uh, Inuit um, had a name for that, a near elite, which is basically breathing cold air so bad that you cough up blood. That's kind of a loose translation. But the thing that you have to watch out for with the dogs is that that breathing is obligatory. And so that water loss is obligatory. And, you know, the dogs will lose about, you know, somewhere between 350 and 400 mils of water per hour through their respiratory tract. And they can't stop that. That is something that is beyond anybody's control. Hour for hour for hour, you wind up with a phenomenon where the dogs will replace half of their body water a day while they're exercising, which means that they have to be drinking the equivalent of half of their body water a day in order to keep from getting dehydrated. The irony is that if they get dehydrated due to the cold, they're actually at greater risk of overheating because without full hydration, they can't move the heat from the muscle to the tongue and get rid of it into the atmo atmosphere. And so the, the effect of the dehydration that was a result of the cold actually creates greater risk for overheating. So the last part that I wanna talk about is oxygen. So we talked about getting the the glucose and fatty acids into the muscle cell. We talked about getting rid of heat. But what about the oxygen? This was some of the fun stuff that we've done. So how do they get enough? Um, for those of you that study exercise, um, that is one of our attempts at a VO2 max on, and that's not a sled dog, that's actually a Marine Corps explosive detection dog that we trained like a sled dog. Um, that's seven liters per minute of oxygen consumption. Dog's about 25 kilos, that puts him well over 300 mils per kilo per minute of oxygen consumption. That's not a max. A max would have sequential increases in workload without an increase in oxygen consumption. We did not meet the criteria for maximal oxygen consumption test. This would be called a VO2 peak. Why didn't we? We ran out of treadmill. You know, dog, you know, this, and it's not this picture, it was later on in the workout. Dog was doing 17 miles an hour up an 18% grade 
with his tail wagging and he was just having the greatest time of his life. We ran out of treadmill. We couldn't incline and speed the treadmill up anymore to make him work more. But it was a phenomenal thing when you consider that Lance Armstrong at his chemically enhanced best was managing about a third of that or less. So routinely these guys may get well over 300 mils per kilo per minute when fully conditioned. Um, far in excess of Tour de France cyclists, far in excess of horses. Um, how important is it? Well, you know, y'all have seen this picture of Mount Everest. Um, there's not a lot of oxygen available in Mount Everest and that's why you've got a traffic jam is that it's taking these guys about an hour to walk a mile. Um, and that's because in the end oxygen is flowing down a concentration gradient to get to the point in the muscle cell where it gets burned inside the mitochondria. At the tissue level you get 50 percent of your oxygen burning capacity with a par oxygen partial pressure of about 31 millimeters of mercury. The available oxygen at the top of Mount Everest is about 26. So when these guys are trudging up that last ridge, their muscles are operating at maybe 20% capacity, which explains why it's taking them so long. But on the other hand, you know, dogs have dragged a sled to the top of Denali. So, you know, the same mountain that it takes people a little bit of time to get up to. So we wanted to see what it would look like, and the military wanted to see what it would look like, if we took away the dog's oxygen. So we built an oxygen chamber, and we put a treadmill in it, we put the dogs in it, and um, those of you, the, the, the veterinary students and the veterinary, uh, the veterinary oriented people, what do you see about this dog that bothers you? His tongue is a little blue, isn't it? We noticed that too. You know, in, in fact, that's why, uh, that's why the, the video is muted is because you didn't want to hear the conversation that we were having. And it's like, it, it, was, it was basically, uh, that looks kind of blue. Uh, what do you think we ought to do? And, you think, and you know, we're sitting there watching the dog and the dog's just cruising right along. Um, he went on like that for another 90 minutes uh, until he got bored and decided he didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and again, you know, we're sitting there in the cold, not just in the cold, but we're also having to be on oxygen because we, you know, we've got the oxygen scrubbed out to the equivalent of about 14, uh, uh, 14,000, 15,000 feet of altitude, about the equivalent of Pikes Peak. Um, and, you know, they just went on and on and on. And it took us a little while to figure out how they were doing this, but it, we suddenly realized what good is oxygen on a hemoglobin molecule? Is that where it needs to be? Does it do anything there? It doesn't actually do anything there. It needs to be inside the cell to be burned. And so the dogs have come up with an interesting little arrangement where instead of prioritizing nice red blood, they'll let their blood go blue. They'll let their hemoglobin desaturate in order to get the oxygen into the muscle to be burned. Kind of freaks you out if you're used to seeing like pink tissues, but you know, when we take the dogs from sea level and put them in the oxygen, you know, the altitude chamber, you know, they, they, they would have uh, a little bit of decrement in exercise capacity, so they go down about, you know, 15%. If you do that for a human, your exercise capacity goes down about 70%. And what's cool is that the dogs recover their exercise capacity, their sea level exercise capacity within about 24 hours. Y'all won't. <laughs> you know, it's like, y'all actually never will recover your true sea level exercise capacity. You'll get a little bit better than a 70% decrement, but you're not gonna get all the way back to normal. The dogs are able to adapt to get all the way back to normal within 24 hours at you know an equivalent of about 15,000 feet of altitude. So, you know, they, they, they keep doing things that 
defy explanation. And it, I mean, we finally realized that, you know, we have to refer to Einstein's definition of insanity, you know, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Well, my friend Waylon has his own version, which is, you know, if I'm doing something that you can't do, I'm probably going about it differently than you are. And so that's how, you know, we've kind of come to understand these dogs is that we can't run a thousand miles in eight days. So obviously they've got to be doing something different than we are because they can. And that's really the gist of the, the research program. So, you know, bottom line is that, you know, if you're asking who's the best endurance athlete, they're the ones that are eating raw meat, running naked, and sleeping in the snow. So I would be happy to answer questions. Anybody got a question? Anybody want to go to Alaska? Um, the, the primary reason that humans are less able um, is because we're not set up to pant. So the key trick that the dogs have is that <coughs> they, can, they can adjust their, their CO2 um, by panting, but they don't get dizzy and they don't, their, their pH doesn't get out of whack like ours would if we tried to pant as hard as they did. So by keeping their pH normal, their hemoglobin basically loses um, affinity for oxygen, whereas a human, if you pant, if you try to pant as hard as they do, CO2 goes down, pH goes up, and when pH goes up, hemoglobin retains oxygen more. So the key for the dogs is actually the fact that they were designed to be able to pant without screwing up their pH. And, and so they just do when they're at altitude. Anyone else? No? All right. Oh, there, there is one. The question is whether uh, the, you know, since humans, when they're at altitude, they'll secrete more erythropoiet and make more red blood cells. Do the dogs do that? Um, we've not measured erythropoietin, but we do know that if you leave them in, in the altitude chamber long enough, their, their red blood cell counts will start going up. So, and I assume that that's through the same mechanism, but you know, then again, everything else that I've assumed about how the dogs go about doing things has been wrong. So, you know, who knows what they're actually doing. We've not really looked at it that, that closely. Yep, one more. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, about the racing them, uh, race, races themselves, how do they supply the team? Uh, yeah, they, they, uh, um, the, one of the ways that the race has gotten faster is that the, they're having to carry less and less and they're, they ship uh, supplies out to checkpoints ahead of time. So for, uh, for example, Iditarod, um, the average uh, musher will slip, ship out about 4,500 pounds of equipment and food, food for themselves, food for the dogs, stuff like that. And that'll all go out about a month ahead of time and get distributed to all the checkpoints. Um, some of the other races, so Iditarod in that thousand miles has 26 checkpoints. So you don't have to really go that far from checkpoint to checkpoint. Um, there's another race that occurs a month earlier, the Yukon Quest, which is also a thousand miles. They have eight checkpoints. So, I mean, there are, sections of that race where you're traveling 200 miles with no support and you have to carry all of that in your sled. It's a much, much tougher race to run um, because you know, you're not getting weighted on hand and foot. You're, you're, I mean, you're out there for two days 
all by yourself with nothing but what you brought in the sled to keep you going. So yeah, it depends on the different races, but in general, nobody tries to carry that kind of you know, supply the entire time, because it would, it would you know, like I say, you're talking about thousands of pounds of supplies. Uh, at the first part of that question again? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, it's, not a, it's not a huge, you know, sort of chemical mystery at this point. They're, they're just, they're, they're operating at a much, much lower level of hemoglobin saturation. They still wind up kind of, you know, the, the, it gets oxygenated in the lungs and deoxygenated when it gets through the muscle. But instead of being up at the top of the hemoglobin curve where everything would be red, they're operating at the middle um, where a lot of it's blue. The, the question is uh, capillaries in the muscle, because the more capillaries you have, the shorter the distance everything has to diffuse to get into the cells. That's the one part that we have not ever looked at, is that we've never really looked and see, to see whether or not that's part of their conditioning program. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question, and, and I don't have an answer for it, but um, we know that that happens in other species for sure. You know, it would seem reasonable for the dogs to do that, but I don't know whether they do. Well, I appreciate y'all coming out and paying attention, and I hope you uh, hope you learned something. Thank you. <laughs>